One element that, uh, that I think is going to get really interesting on the other side of the election, and I don't know if it's two months or, or four months or eight months, but I actually think there's a pretty meaningful probability that we'll get comprehensive immigration reform done in the next year, let's say. Uh, there's just a lot of political forces lining up, and that would be a great thing for the country. I've been supportive for some time of the, uh, of the Senate bill, which drew 78 yes votes in the Senate. Uh, that would be good uh, for all kinds of things, our economy, for small businesses, for Social Security, for Medicare in the next Congress, which I hope I'm part of, um, uh, not likely in the lame duck, would be uh, a comprehensive tax reform. People have come to see, largely because of the inversions, uh, you know, Burger King becoming a Canadian company tends to sort of cause many of my colleagues to sit up and say, hey, wait a minute here. Um, you know, I do think that's an opportunity to recast a tax code which is arguably unfair and certainly uncompetitive, um, which if we could do, I think would be, along with infrastructure investment, kind of a nice boost for the economy. I have spent a lot of time as a member of the Intelligence Committee on the question of the Middle East and, <clears throat> you know, a lot of my colleagues and a lot of my constituents are at a point where they kind of want to, you know, wash their hands and say, no mas. Um, <clears throat> that's really not an option. Uh, y you know, we, we saw uh, on 9-11 what can come out of ungoverned space. Um, and so, you know, w we all have to resist, I think, our most intense isolationist instincts. But we need to be there, sm we need to be there smart. <clears throat> and we haven't been there smart in, in the last decade. And I think we need to fall back on what we know we do very well um, and avoid what we don't do well. Um, we hunt down terrorists and terrorist leaders uh, and use our military uh, exceptionally well uh, for that purpose. Uh, the core Al-Qaeda leadership has been decimated. Now that doesn't mean that Al-Qaeda is gone, they have fragmented and that's part of the story. But uh, you know, if you're a terrorist leader in Yemen or North Africa or Afghanistan or Pakistan or, or, or Iraq, uh, we will find you and we will kill you. Um, and we're quite good at that. What we're not terribly good at is um, the next day. How do we help a society that is as um, uh, flat on its back as a place like Afghanistan or Iraq or Libya is? How do we help them form a country, nation building? Um, you look at Afghanistan, you look at Iraq, you look at Libya, all places where we intervened in pretty significant ways. And again, the military intervention did exactly what it was supposed to be. And I don't think anybody would look at any of those three countries and say, but, and, and now we're happy with the situation. So part two, of course, is, in a, you know, the, keeping these guys on their heels is important. It's important to our security. It's important to the security of Israel and Europe. But part two has to follow, and that has to be countries in the region finally sobering up and recognizing that they have got to um, undertake the changes and do the things they need to do to eliminate the conditions that allow radical Islam to flourish. Stop funding the guys. We've been seeing a double game for a long time. Countries like Pakistan, others in the Gulf, saying that they're allies of ours, but at, at, at best turning a blind eye to local philanthropies, to local rich people, funding the very people that they are supposedly fighting. Um, we need to demand that more of what we're seeing now where uh, respected Muslim clerics are standing up and saying the Islamic State is not Islamic, do away with their, their religious legitimacy. We need to demand more of that. And then a much larger project, we need to demand that these societies begin to open up some. I mean, a society has to be pretty appalling, pretty, it has to be completely bereft of economic and political opportunity for people, for people to embrace monsters like ISIS, right? If that's who your solution is, the problem is really pretty ugly. And whether it's Assad or Maliki in Iraq or, uh, you know, dare I say, some of the, you know, kingdoms uh, in the Gulf that are not providing their people with accountability, that are not allowing them to participate in the political sphere, that's got to change. Um, and we shouldn't I'm not going neoliberal Wolfowitz uh, on that. I'm just saying that over some period of time, they need to recognize that if uh, you know, they don't allow women to vote, if they don't allow young men to actually sort of express themselves in constructive ways, that'll bottle up into really uh, ugly explosions.
Um, and it's not, that sounds like a nice thing to say, it's a hard thing to say, right? Because we're allied with Saudi Arabia, which is hardly a model of open liberal government. Uh, Bahrain, largest naval base in the region we've got there, hardly a model. So, but we're gonna need to do that work and push those you know, regimes in that direction. The different countries have different challenges. So the Iraqis, for example, the Iraqis need to come, come to a view as to whether they wanna be Iraq or not, right? You know, there is some possibility that the Iraqis, what we call the Iraqis, in fact wanna be Kurdistan, Sunnistan, and whatever, Shiistan in the South. And if that's ultimately where they come out, it would be foolish of us to say, no, we're gonna stand up and demand that you abide by a national configuration that was crafted in the British Ministry of Finance in the 1920s, right? I mean, why would we do that? Um, so that's something for them to figure out. Here's a better example, though, that maybe gets to your question. Um, you know, with Israel, the single largest recipient of foreign aid in the, in the world is Egypt. They get a billion and a half dollars of our taxpayer money a year. Um, President Sisi, jury's out. Uh, you know, on the one hand, he's a very educated, a very smart man. I've had an opportunity to spend some time with him. I think he really understands the core problems in Egypt. On the other hand, he's jailing journalists without charge. You know, 500 Egyptians sentenced to death, you know, in summary fashion. Uh, and you know he is uh, going in that direction of autocracy, and that is very uncomfortable. So we've got a lever there, right? You know, you know President Sisi. You know, look, we want to be your friend. We want to continue to provide the kind of aid we've provided, but that comes with some conditions. And there's a lot of concern and fear right now because Ebola is a pretty devastating virus, but. <clears throat> You know, it doesn't spread through the air. It spreads when you come into contact with the body fluids of an affected individual. Um, we'll control that. And there, there, there will be more cases in this country, but they'll be well controlled. And, um, you know, because we have a healthcare, you know, a real medical infrastructure here, and because our people are well nourished and generally, in, you know, healthy, um, you won't see what you saw in Sierra Leone and elsewhere, where people who start out malnourished, you know, start out with no access to the healthcare system. Uh, when they get sick, they get turned away from a clinic and they're right back in there, very densely populated. Uh, so to answer your question specifically, I think we're in pretty good shape to deal with what will be uh, with us for a little while here. Um, Africa is going to get worse before it gets better. Um, we've committed 2,000 uh, troops to go over there and build hospitals and do some training. I think that's good. I think the world collectively should probably do more because it's still it's getting worse uh, there, not better. Where the stock market is today reflects the fact that the American business community, look at anybody's earnings, look at corporate earnings, they're doing pretty darn well. And that's reflected in the stock market. It also reflects something that, that, that we should all be attuned to, which is zero percent interest rates. The Federal Reserve has you know, basically created an environment of free money, which has been pretty important to bringing back the economy. Um, but uh, it has inflated asset prices, and it has also badly hurt uh, retirees and others who live on interest or, or fixed income. So it, it is fortunately, I think, in my opinion, not an area in which the Congress has a lot to say. Thank goodness we're not in charge of setting interest rates, but it is absolutely something to be aware of because uh, when the Fed starts raising interest rates, there will be reverberations uh, in the economy. But having gotten a very substantial grant uh, for Washington Village to be rebuilt, I'm hugely excited about that um, for two reasons. One, because Washington Village is a, is a pretty dilapidated place to live. But number two, we're going to be able to kind of take the concept of affordable housing into the 21st century. And what I mean by that is Washington Village perfectly reflects the way they used to think about, you know, affordable or, you know, public housing in the 40s and 50s, which is, you know, put your poor people in a in a development, right? I mean, thank God it's not the Chicago-style 20-story tower, you know, but it's a, um, it, here in Norwalk, when we rebuild that, which will start soon, it'll be mixed income, right? So you'll have middle-class people down there. There'll be retail, so there'll be an ability to go to the store to buy XYZ jobs. So I'm really excited about that, um, and I want to see that through to the point where Norwalk, uh, you know, the, the little corridor there of Washington Street is not isolated um, economically from what is two blocks um, uh, towards the sound, south, I guess. When Walkbridge uh, uh, caused so much havoc, uh, a lot of us uh, really pounded the table for the money now. Look, it was going to get replaced someday and rebuilt someday, but a lot of us really pounded the table for money now. That's no way, to use exactly the wrong metaphor, to run a railroad, right? Because, you know, you know, the next thing, this bridge out here, you know, it'll come down and, and now all of a sudden we'll be focused on that. So that's, that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to recognize that we've got those problems and assemble the package of financing and the timing. Um, 
What does that involve? That involves not screwing around as we have been for a long time with temporary fixes to the, uh, the surface transportation fund. It means creating a national infrastructure bank, which I was, uh, the bill for which I'm an original co-sponsor, so we can bring in some private money um, and, and, and dealing, it, dealing with uh, the transportation issue, not on a one-off, you know, today's emergency is XYZ basis, but, but, but really having a strategy to, to bring all this infrastructure into the 21st century. Our work is not done. I mean, you know, uh, we have a long way to go yet to where we can say this economy is really driving prosperity for all Americans. And, you know, it is, you're hearing this from a Democrat, it is not, you know, all the government's job to drive prosperity, but it absolutely is the government's job to set the conditions and build the infrastructure and provide the framework whereby, whereby motivated, hardworking people can succeed. And we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to continue to work on all, all the stuff we've talked about, right? What makes an economy move, right? Good infrastructure, availability of education. Um, these, are, these are things that, uh, that need fixing.